Good morning, Cross Park. Welcome to our digital service for Sunday, October 17th. I have a couple of quick announcements for you. One is next Sunday. So if you are worshiping with us virtually this Sunday, but would be able to join us next Sunday, October 24th, we're having a Fall Fellowship Fun Lunch. Basically, it's just an opportunity to connect with one another on the property at RTS. So directly after the service, we'll be meeting together. We're going to have drinks and desserts provided by the church, and then we're also going to have food trucks that you can purchase food from, or you're certainly welcome to bring your own lunch. But we'd love for you to plan on staying for lunch on October 24th and enjoy catching up with new and old friends. You may have heard uh, Jordan, we announced several weeks ago, Jordan was candidating at Uptown Church for their senior pastor role, and he has officially been offered and accepted that job. So we are excited for him. We're sad that he's leaving Cross Park, but we want to send him out on a really good note. So we're going to have a going away party, a goodbye party, so to speak, on November 14th. It's a Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. over at the Hemby Y. Please plan to join us to say goodbye to the old Shevskys and to pray for them as they head into this new season of ministry. Well, that's all I have for you. Announcement-wise, remember to check your email and our website for regular updates. And now let's transition into a time of worship and hear today's call to worship from Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for calling us to worship you, for both reminding us of your greatness of how worthy you are of our lives and our worship, and of your nearness. That you are great and mighty, but you are also kind and good, and you come close to us. And that all we have to do is to feel our need of you, to come in truth calling on you, asking for mercy and grace. So, Father, we pray that as we worship today, that you would engage our hearts And teach us what it looks like to follow you and to be close to you. Father, we thank you that we can only be close to you because Jesus has come close to us. And so we pray that by his strength and by our connection to him by faith, that we will sense him leading us in worship today. We ask it in his great name. Amen.
confession today, as you see on your screen, is from the New City Catechism. It's a relatively new a way to summarize historic creeds and catechism questions into modern language that we can use to remember what it is that God has taught us in His Word. So, today, I'll ask the question, we'll answer it together, and it's about how we are to engage God's Word, the Bible. Here's the question. How is the Word of God to be read and heard? With diligence, preparation, and prayer, so that we may accept it with faith, store it in our hearts, and practice it in our lives. Amen. All things belong to God. He has graciously shared good things with us, and so we lovingly give back to Him out of what He's given to us as our act of worship. You're welcome to pause the video now and look, if you're on a computer, to the right of the video on the worship page, or on a phone or tablet, you can look below the video and you'll see several links that you can use now or later to give. But we encourage you to give as part of your spiritual act of worship. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer, and we'll start with a time of silent confession of sin. Lord, we come this morning confessing our sin, not because we know it all, not because we want to seem sorry or righteous, not because we understand the dynamics of how sin works fully. But we do know this, that you are great and good and mighty, you are holy, and that you tell us to come calling on you, asking for mercy and grace. And so, we want to come acknowledging our sin. We acknowledge first that we're sinners, that our very nature is that we're bent away from you and bent in on ourselves. We're turned in on ourselves so that we don't follow you. We don't listen to you. We don't do what you'd have us do. But also that we have sinned. We have Our nature has worked itself out naturally in acts of commission where we've done things we should not have done, and acts of omission where we've avoided doing things that you would call us to do. We've sinned externally, uh, obviously, in our actions towards other people. We've sinned with our words. So much of our sin is related to what we say and how we uh, tear down other people and try to build ourselves up and make ourselves something when we are nothing. And then also in our thoughts. Father, there's so much that if our if our thoughts were revealed, we would be ashamed and embarrassed by what we really think about people and how we think about ourselves and how much we think about ourselves and how often we think about ourselves. Lord, we ask that you would forgive all these sins. We're not going to pretend we're not sinful. We're not going to pretend we haven't sinned. That would be foolish and it would go against your word. So we confess our sinfulness and our sinning and we do all that to cast ourselves on your mercy. Father, how good it is to know that you are a God who hears, that you uphold us even as we fall. You raise us up even as we're bowed down in our sin. We look to you and you offer us mercy and grace. You satisfy the desires of our hearts. You're righteous and you're kind and you're near. You're near to us. And you come near to us by forgiving us, by offering us what we don't deserve. Not simply ignoring or even wiping away our sin, but by giving us your own righteousness, by calling us your people and declaring us to be your children, to, be, to belong to you, to know you. Father, we are, we are humbled and overjoyed that you would forgive our sins so fully that you'd offer us your righteousness and you would lead us in your ways. Father, as we think about um, all the things you might have for us, we pray for a few things this morning. 
um, in addition to the forgiveness that we've received, we want direction. We need wisdom in life. We need to be discerning so much in how we deal with the people and situations around us are connected to whether or not we can be wise, whether or not we can discern a gracious and gospel way to approach the issues in our lives. Father, I pray for people who feel really stuck this morning, stuck with relationships or stuck with circumstances that they simply don't know what to do with. We pray that you would give them wisdom and discernment. Perhaps there's a way out of them. Perhaps there's a resurrection in broken relationships that can happen. Perhaps there is a wise way to handle their circumstances that would be very different from their natural instinct. Father, we also pray that you would give us the opportunity to love the people around us well. We live in a world that is uh, both cynical about religion, of course, but also is dying and hurting and longing for something that would give us meaning beyond entertainment and consumption. We are eaten up with our own desires. We're eaten up with chasing our own success, our own glory. And frankly, most of us at some level, whether we want to admit it or not, are sort of sick of it. We see how little it provides for us. It's, it always underdelivers and underwhelms. And so we pray that you would give us opportunities in the lives of the people around us to show and tell about your grace and mercy. We pray that you would lead us in that and give us great opportunity in people's lives this week. Father, finally, we pray for uh, the long-term location of Cross Park. We have mentioned a few times recently that we have some, some new, some fresh options in, uh, in front of us that could turn into a long-term location, but we don't know what you're going to do. So we pray specifically for a couple of these locations that you would give us clarity and that you would give us a long-term location, that we would have an answer on that. Uh, in the next few weeks even, that you would show us what you want to do. Father, we thank you that as we offer up all these prayers to you, we know you hear us. We know you will receive these prayers as the askings of your children, and you will do what is right and good with them for your kingdom, and for your will, for your glory, and for our good. So we humbly and delightedly offer these things to you and look forward to seeing how you work. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
As you probably know, we're working through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, Jordan last week wrapped up chapter 2 and caught the first paragraph of chapter 3. Today we are in chapter 3, verses 13 through 35. Listen closely. This is what God wants to say to us this morning. And he, meaning Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and by the prince of demons he casts out the demons. And he called to them and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. Let's pray together. Father, we offer these prayers up to you because we know how little we understand on our own. We know how much we need your help. So we ask that you would help us. Help us to understand, not just to understand concepts, but to 
know them deeply, to respond in our hearts and with our lives. Teach us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. What's the difference between being an outsider and an insider? I mean, you can think in any number of settings. If you're an insider to a group versus being an outsider to a group, what is different? Well, I've got at least three things. The first is knowledge. It's about what you know. It's about what's in your head. If you're an insider, you have a good understanding, usually, of what the group is about, what it stands for. Your knowledge of the group is not just theoretical. It's experiential. You're in the group, so you really know what the group is about. Secondly, being an insider versus an outsider is about belonging. In your heart, you feel like you belong. You feel like you are accepted in this group. This group is home to me. It's part of my identity. An outsider typically has no identity ties to a group, maybe even feels explicitly disconnected from or alienated by that group. Third, there's an issue of commitment. What do you do? So you see you've got head, hands, and heart, uh, knowledge, belonging, commitment. Because I understand and belong, I participate in the group. My commitment is putting my, my knowledge and my belonging into practice in some significant way, in living it out, that I'm motivated and animated by what the group is about, what the group stands for. An outsider, by definition, uh, even if they understand what the group is about, even if maybe they used to belong to the group, part of what makes them an outsider is that their lives are not driven or motivated or animated by being a part of the group and by the values that the group espouses. At this point in Mark 3, he is starting to show us this developing sense of two groups, those who are insiders, those who are close to Jesus, and those who are on the outside of what Jesus is doing for a variety of reasons. In last week's passage, as Jesus was clashing with religious leaders about their bad practices of good Old Testament ideas, we heard a very ominous note in 3.6. That paragraph wraps up by saying, they, meaning the religious leaders, held counsel on how to destroy him. It's fair to say if someone wants to destroy you, you could usually count them in the category of outsiders. Now, we've also seen consistently in Mark crowds. Where do crowds fit into the insider-outsider scheme? Well, the crowds like Jesus. They find him entertaining. That's not always the same as believing him or following him. You can't always tell who believes what in a crowd by definition. The role of the crowd then sometimes is positive. Sometimes it's neutral and often it's even negative. So the crowds are a bit of a question mark for Mark. You do see a growing group of insiders, and today's passage is going to give us a healthy sense of what that insiderness means. If you would, look closely at the outline for today's passage. You know, I spend a decent amount of time on the outline, both for your good and mine, trying to organize the passage and organize the sermon in a way that we can really see what Mark is trying to show us about Jesus and we can do something useful with it. Uh, remember, our understanding of the text is important, but not so you could pass an exam. We don't have any exams to be a member at Cross Park. Rather, we want you to understand it so you can truly know what it means experientially, not theoretically, that you can know what it means to belong to Jesus and to grow in your commitment to Jesus. So today we're going to see how Jesus works, what he's doing, and then how various groups, both insiders and outsiders, respond to him. Mark is displaying Jesus and his authority and his power and his goodness. Jesus is driving the action. And then these various groups of insiders and outsiders are reacting and responding. And their reactions ultimately end up defining them. So look at your outline. And we're going to see this back and forth. Jesus calls in the first section. They come. Point two, Jesus comes, they critique. Of course, it's a different they each time. In the third section, Jesus calls and clarifies, and they condemn and demonize. And finally, in the last section, Jesus contrasts, and then you'll see I have a series of question marks. There's a bit of an open-ended finale. So let's start with 13 through 19. Jesus calls. 
You know, there are tons of Old Testament connections in Mark, but usually they are allusions and not quotes. Mark, however, did start the book with some quotes in the first three verses of Mark 1. He quoted Isaiah and also Malachi and Exodus. And what he was showing is that Jesus coming is fulfilling patterns from the Old Testament, that he is the promised king, he's on the march, and he's bringing both judgment and restoration to a world that desperately needs both. Here, then, Jesus is creating a mountaintop experience for us to consider. In the Old Testament, we have lots of examples of God meeting with his people on mountains. Abraham meets with God on a mountain, Genesis 22. Elijah meets with God on a mountain in 1 Kings 6. The temple is on a mountain, so God's people every year go up to the festivals to meet with God. And of course, the most prominent and significant mountaintop experience is God meeting with Moses on Mount Sinai to give his people the Ten Commandments. There, he reminds them that he called Israel out of Egypt to save them. I am the Lord your God who called you out of Egypt. And he did it so they could follow him, belong to him, and be committed in a new way. So the whole Exodus event, including the mountaintop giving of the commandments, was really a community-forming event. So here, Mark's showing us that Jesus is echoing that part of Israel's story, and he's calling to himself a new Israel. Notice he has 12 apostles, which of course mirrors the 12 tribes of Israel, people who are supposed to respond humbly to God's call. Uh, Mark's language about this is especially strong in what Jesus is doing. Verse 13, he's calling those whom he desired. Uh, This has the strong sense of summoning those that he willed to be apostles. So Jesus decided they're apostles, so he summons them and they come. Verse 14, when it says he appointed the 12, the literal translation would be he made the 12. Interestingly, the verb here for making or appointing them is the same word as the Greek translation of Genesis 1, that God created. See, Jesus has just created a new Israel. This is new creation. Then we see Jesus naming them the apostles, and he even renames some of them. This is both like Adam in the garden, naming the animals, But also, God is always naming and renaming his people to give them purpose and dignity, to work redemptively through speaking the truth, a better truth, over his people. So it's pretty clear here, Jesus is calling these 12 leaders of a new Israel, and he's showing them and us that what it means to be Israel, ultimately, what it means to be God's people, is to respond to what God is doing. So Jesus powerfully calls them. And as they come, I want you to notice what language we get about the apostles. What are they like? How are they described? First, and most importantly, it says that he calls them that they might be with him. Discipleship, first and foremost, is always about belonging to Jesus. Being rightly related to him. It's always about being with him before it's about any sense of working with him or for him. And this is massively important because this is how the gospel works. The gospel is about Jesus, what he does, and then we simply belong to him. We simply come to be with him. And then, yes, once we're with him, it's important that he calls us to work with him, to care about the kingdom, to send his people out. That's part of our purpose as Christians, but of first importance, the thing that constitutes us as his people his relationship. It's being with him. And then once we're with him, once we're insiders, we can be sent to outsiders to offer them the chance to become insiders as well. Now here, when he calls these apostles, apostleship in one sense is a unique role. Well, we call it their capital A apostles, right? They have a special role in the early church that we don't think has continued. But so none of us are capital A apostles, but the word itself The word apostle means to be sent out. So Jesus calls them close, and when they come, they sense their belonging to him, and then they join in his purposes, and they go out to preach and have authority over the demons, it says. Now, Mark has given a lot of emphasis 
on Jesus dealing with demons because he's showing that Jesus is a king on the invasion and this demonic activity is just naturally his enemies arming themselves for conflict. Now, up to this point in Mark, all the authority has always and solely been in Jesus. And that's as it should be, still true. But now, Jesus is choosing to delegate, to share his authority with his people so they can go out and represent his kingdom in a new way. Now, when he gives us the name of the disciples, in addition to dignifying them, there's also the inclusion of Judas, who would later betray him. Now, this is useful to us for multiple reasons. One, it tweaks any idyllic expectations of perfect relationships in the inner circle. Uh, There's no perfect church. Not even Jesus had a perfect group of disciples. Even their relationships weren't right. I mean, one of the insiders worked violently against Jesus, betrayed him in order to make some money. This also begins to adjust a bit more our sense of the insider and outsider concept. It's not two totally distinct groups that can't have any crossing over between them. Not at all. Some apparent insiders, like Judas, will reveal themselves to ultimately be outsiders. And lots of current outsiders will end up becoming true insiders. Now, as we consider this, let's move to point two. In point two, more should-be insiders are acting like outsiders. Look at 20 and 21. It tells us Jesus came home. Almost certainly this means he comes back to Capernaum, back to Peter's house. This has been his consistent home base in Mark so far. You see here it says the crowd gathered again. So just like they did in chapter 2, they're doing it again here. All of this points to Peter's house in Capernaum. So it's fascinating then that his family comes from Nazareth to Capernaum to seize him. Now the word for family here is a little ambiguous. Really the phrase is his people. Uh, We see later that his mother and brothers are there, so it makes sense that this is his family, but it could also be other family members or close friends who have come, and they've come to get Jesus. They're acting in a way that we think is perhaps a little strange because they should be insiders. They're his people. They should be supporting him, one would think, but they're not at all. You know, calling Capernaum his home, as Mark does, when everyone knows he's from Nazareth, is also highlighting the conflict. He belongs to his kingdom mission even more than he does to his blood relatives, it seems. And as his family has heard about his public ministry, well, they're kind of embarrassed. Jesus has gone viral. Peter put it on Instacavim. Even got a page two mention in the Capernaum Chronicle. Everyone's talking about Jesus and the family is embarrassed. It's making them look bad. I mean, come on, man. You're really out there. You're, you're making people uncomfortable. You've got to stop. Maybe even they're thinking, hey, we'll get him to return to his real home, his real profession. Hey, come back and join the family business. Come back and stay where you belong. Notice their critique takes a pretty strong form. They're saying to themselves, he's out of his mind. Now, before we go any farther in the text, let's think about this for a second together. What are they doing? Well, really, they want to control Jesus, right? They're not happy with him. They feel like he's reflecting badly on them, so they're acting a bit oddly. Clearly, they're trying to control him, to bind him, to seize him. They're trying to talk sense into him, to straighten him out. Now, as bad of a move as we know this to be, uh, I think we can relate a little bit. I mean, all of us have been embarrassed at some point by family members, right? I mean, uh, kids, if you're watching today, you know at some point you have a sibling who embarrasses you, and certainly by the time you get to be late elementary school or middle school, your parents will seem rather embarrassing to you. But beyond just the sense of embarrassment, there's more going on. There is the danger always for us of thinking that our own ways are the most important ways, and so our stuff, whatever that is, is actually more important than kingdom stuff. We all actually live for our own kingdoms. We live in such a way that my desires, my success, my outcomes are central to what I want. 
And so sometimes when we consider following God or even actually begin to follow God, unfortunately, we often do it simply for selfish motives. We're hoping to get some sort of benefit out of it. Now, listen, there are massive benefits. The Bible is very clear. There are massive benefits to following Jesus, especially eternally. But he calls us to follow him based on his authority in his identity. He really is God. He has all authority. He made us. Thus, he's worth following whether we get what we want out of the situation or not. Now, just as we're having these thoughts and as we're wrestling with what Jesus, family, and friends are doing, and as we consider how maybe we try to control Jesus, we try to work outcomes, we even do religious things to get what we want, Mark shifts to some true outsiders in verse 22, and this is our third point. It tells us that scribes are coming down from Jerusalem. The down comment, uh, you know, sometimes we get confused on a map. We think north is up and south is down. Obviously, that isn't true. Jerusalem is at about 2,500 feet elevation. Capernaum is below sea level, minus 200 feet below sea level. So the religious leaders are traveling from on high, from the center of both political and religious authority. They're coming all the way down out here into, uh, you know, the hinterlands to deal with what they've been hearing about Jesus. They've come down from their high place and they're looking for a fight. Their position on Jesus is very clear. And whether, exactly whether they've said this or whether they're saying it or whether they're just letting it be known quietly among themselves, their position is this. The works that Jesus has been doing are very powerful, but they are actually in service of the devil. Now, this is a pretty big step up, right? His family, you could argue, they're just confused. They're a little embarrassed and ashamed. And so they've misconstrued or misunderstood his ministry. The religious leaders, however, have taken it to a new place. They're actually saying that the good things Jesus is doing are bad things. This is substantial and determined opposition. So verse 23, then it says, Jesus calls to them, or rather calls them to him. This is a pretty consistent way that Mark shares something significant that Jesus has to say. And it's showing that he's clearly in control of the conversation, that he's directly confronting them for their condemning beliefs about Jesus. Now, when it says that they believed he was connected to Beelzebul, lots of ink has been spilled on that. But all you need to know is that Jesus clearly sees that as a synonym for Satan. Jesus is working for Satan, according to these religious leaders. Jesus points out two significant flaws in what they're saying. The first is, it doesn't make any sense, like logically. It just doesn't follow. He's saying, wait a second, if I'm working for Satan, why would I be defeating Satan's forces, right? Uh, it would be a house or a kingdom divided against itself. If a house or a kingdom is ultimately fighting against itself, its downfall is imminent. It's already on its way to defeat. So you guys aren't making any sense that when you argue that I'm working for Satan. Now, the second problem with their position is they don't understand that, in fact, Jesus is actively working against Satan. He's bringing about the demise of this evil kingdom. And Jesus gives this little parable an analogy. Satan is a strong man, and Jesus' arrival is a home invasion. See, when John the Baptist announced that there was someone mightier than he coming, the mighty one here is at work. He's invading the kingdom of the devil. He's tying him up and plundering the kingdom, which means both Satan's forces are being defeated and his captives are being released. This is an echo of Isaiah 49, where Isaiah says about the servant of the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you and I will save your children. That's what Jesus is doing. He's fighting against the tyrant. He's defeating him and tying him up and he's rescuing those who are captive to him. He's bringing life where death once ruled. The old master is no longer in power, and the new master is both stronger 
and better. And yet, these outsiders condemn Jesus. They literally demonize him, saying he has an unclean spirit. And so they are described, what they're doing is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Only this story in the Gospels, which Matthew and Luke tell as well, it's only in this story where this phrase, the blaspheming, blaspheming of the Holy Spirit, comes up at all. It's clearly a very strong and solemn warning to not decide that God's goodness is actually evil. They're so deluded. They're so committed in their opposition to Jesus that they basically call God the devil and thus are guilty of eternal sin. Now let's unpack this a little bit pastorally. What does this mean for us? People have read this and understandably been very concerned and nervous about this throughout church history. First, it doesn't mean you can lose your salvation because the Bible is very clear that you can't lose your salvation. It's not like everything is forgivable, but if you commit this one sin, you're going to lose your salvation. The Bible is clear, first of all, that that can't happen. But also, if that was true, if your salvation could be totally secure except for the sin, then the New Testament would warn Christians that this is a problem for them. It's not a concern. If you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and thus you can't commit this sin. You're not going to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Also, some people have tried to just say this is sort of a euphemism. It's another way of just saying rejecting God or committing really bad sin. Well, Paul's a good example. He rejects God and commits some really bad sin and later repents and becomes a key figure in the New Testament church. In fact, lots of God's people have participated in really bad sin by any measurement, and yet they aren't rejected. They find forgiveness and grace. I mean, look at verse 28. He says, all kinds of sins and blasphemies can be forgiven outside of this. There's not a single example in Scripture of people repenting and asking for forgiveness of God and not being forgiven by Him. So it seems that this is this idea of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is an extreme, deliberate antagonism toward God with no repentance and no softening of heart at all. Uh, this is a common comment, but I think it fits here. If you are concerned that you have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, or you're doing it now, or you might do it someday in the future, if you're concerned about that, if that bothers you, then you shouldn't be concerned that you've done it because you actually have a soft heart. <laughs> You have a tender heart towards God. You see the extremity of what these religious leaders are doing. They're saying that God in the flesh is actually working for the devil. This is ultimately about your heart status before Jesus. Being soft-hearted and aiming for repentance is always a safeguard on our hearts. And an unwillingness to repent of any sin is always a cause for major concern about what's going on internally. See, outsiders stay away from Jesus because of their hard hearts, while the soft hearts of insiders draw them close and keep them connected. Let's say that again. Ultimately, outsiders, because of their hard hearts, their hearts never soften and they stay on the outside, while the soft hearts of people bring them close and keep them close to Jesus' heart. So, now we're returning in our final section in 31 through 35 to questions of true family. Look at 31. Jesus is making a very significant point in this final paragraph. He's teaching at home base in Capernaum. You see how Mark kind of interrupted the story of the family, and now we're back to it. His mother and brothers are outside. They can't get in the house, and they're sending a message in to him. The message comes in verse 32, while his... His group, his insiders, are sitting around him and listening to him. Do you see what Mark's doing? He's painting you a picture. His mother and brother, surely they're insiders. They're connected to Jesus. They're close. But they're actually physically stuck on the outside of the house. These other people, some crowd of followers, we don't even get their names. We don't even know who all is there. But they're sitting close to him. Jesus is going to overturn and realign priorities and privileges. He's changing the definition of who the true insiders are. 
His family, again, as we saw, seem to be calling him out. They're trying to stop him, trying to shut him down. And so you wonder, what will Jesus do? And why will he do it? Look at verse 33. Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers? And you can imagine that he probably pauses. And as everyone's thinking, what's the right answer? What's the right answer? He says, you, you are my mother and brothers. The people sitting close around me. Remember what we saw in the calling of the 12. They're called to be with him before anything else. And here we have the same pattern. They're with him. The people sitting at his feet, they're the true family. Jesus' family then is presented here as opposing and misconstruing his ministry. I don't think Mark or Jesus are saying that all family ties are now meaningless or unimportant, but he is contrasting relative priorities. Jesus in the kingdom have to be higher priorities than even doing what your family wants you to do. If your family resents you because of your kingdom values or tries to get you to do their will rather than God's will, you may have to endure significant hardship and misunderstanding from them. Now listen, Mark is not against Jesus' family as a matter of course. In fact, Mary and his brother James are later quite important in the New Testament. But here Mark is showing what is Jesus' ultimate priority. True insiders aren't those who are related to him or associated with him or say they're connected to him. They're not simply those who want to do the will of God. I mean, the Pharisees and the religious leaders would have said, we want to do the will of God. Jesus' mother and brothers might have thought we're doing the best thing. We're doing what God would want us to do by keeping Jesus from further embarrassing himself. But rather, Jesus says his true mothers and brother, mother and brothers are those who do the will of God. So after clarifying that true family is related to being close to Jesus and doing the will of God, the text ends. As gospel writers often do, they don't tell you what happens, what kind of reactions all the characters in the story might have. And it leaves us hanging a little bit, which is why I wrote the outline the way I did. Jesus contrasts who's the true family, who's not in the family. And he doesn't tell us what The crowd inside does. He doesn't tell us what his mother and brothers do. And it leaves us considering how how should we respond to this question of who's an insider and who's an outsider. As you think about your response then, I've got three closing questions for you to consider. Is Jesus' kingdom inclusive or exclusive? Well, from this text, everyone isn't an insider, clearly. And so clearly it's some kind of exclusive. It's not fully inclusive. But the terms of the exclusivity aren't based on what we think. It's not simply those with a good religious resume or good bloodlines or good social status. In fact, those are people who are on the outside in this text. Just when we think we can nail down how Jesus would do it, and certainly what his crowd would expect, would be that these religious leaders who are good people, they're trying to do the right thing, surely they're the ones who would be in on what God's up to. And yet, they're the very people who are on the outside. It's very clear here. They're the outsiders. And Jesus' apostles and some of the nameless crowd is on the inside. Also, even though Jesus chose 12 men as his apostles here, did you notice what he said in verse 35? He wouldn't have had to say it this way. His mother and brothers are looking for him. And he could have just said, You all are my mothers and brothers, mother and brothers, and left it there, but he didn't. He added, you are my mother and my brother and my sisters, right? To explicitly include women in the true family, in the true insiders. Women at the time were culturally second-class citizens, sometimes barely even that. And Jesus is saying, no, no. Mother, brother, sisters, they're all included. See, Jesus' kingdom is wonderfully inclusive and welcoming to all sorts of people who we don't expect that they should or would belong. And it's shockingly exclusive, oftentimes, to those who seem like they have the best shot at being insiders. Those people who you would think would be insiders often reveal that because of their pride, 
And because of their self-righteousness, which, by the way, all of us are prone to struggle with in different ways, because of pride and self-righteousness, they are not inside at all. Jesus constantly flips our assumptions on our heads. Second question. What does Jesus indicate then is really the key to being an insider? You know, Mark strongly emphasizes that all of this starts with Jesus' power and authority. He's the one who calls us to follow. He's the one who's making for himself a people. And then our spiritual heart, our spiritual proximity to him is pictured by this idea of being with him, of sitting at his feet. See, true insiders know him and belong to him and sit at his feet. That's the essence of this. It's relational. It's relationship. That's how we can be an insider. And we can be very religious. We can have all sorts of family pedigree. My father was a pastor. You can be all sorts of religious things. You can have all sorts of good things on your resume. But if you're not sitting at Jesus' feet, if you're not with him, if you don't have a relationship with him, then this text would indicate that you're not on the inside. But then in verse 35, he adds that true insiders do the will of God, which leads us to our final set of questions. What does it mean to do the will of God? And how is that not just some other form of religious performance? We'll take that second question first. Nobody in this text is performing to gain favor with Jesus. His people, those true insiders, they know that Jesus is worth following. They belong to him and they're close to him. And that's always the decisive difference. They're in relationship with Jesus by faith. They trust him. They believe he's worth listening to. And then once they're with him, they can be sent out. Also, as we back up for a second, we think back to the key ways that Mark has started his whole gospel. He's already told us what the will of God is in the book of Mark. And it's this that you should repent and believe in the gospel of the kingdom. And what he's doing then in the rest of the text is revealing all these different ways that Jesus is the king. Our hearts naturally buck Jesus' authority. We want to control life. We even want to control Jesus. We want to decide what's right and true instead of listening to him. You know, we've come to this place culturally where we're told that the best way to be authentic is to look inside to figure out who we really are and what we really want, and then have everyone else get on board with that. Now, if we do that, which sounds freeing, it sounds authentic. If we do that, though, what happens is we're also telling Jesus that he's got to get on board with what we're about, that that's true belonging. But Jesus' take on belonging here is very different, right? Jesus' take on how you truly belong is by treating him as king and giving up your own will and submitting your will to his. So it's the opposite of performing. It's the opposite of proving yourself. It's not building your resume. It's not trying to be enough. In fact, we give up on all of that. And we submit ourselves to the kingdom of God. Just to make it even clearer, There's another place where Jesus talks explicitly about what the will of God is, and it's not performance. Listen to Mark, to John 640. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. See, that's the will of the Father, that we repent and believe in the gospel of the kingdom. We look at Jesus, and we see He can pull us out of our hard-hearted self directed living. And he offers us this chance to know him, to belong and be close to him, and then to work with him in his kingdom mission. Do you see that the joy of being an insider is connected to your close relationship to Jesus, to really knowing him, to knowing him first and letting him tell you who you are? To do that, then you've got to give up the pride of directing and controlling your own life and making your own identity. Can you do that? Do you see that Jesus calls you to give up your own way, to give up your own will, to stop trying to control your life and to actually submit it to him? And what this text shows us is that Jesus loves to invite outsiders 
to soften their hearts and to become true insiders and thus to be lavished with all grace and love to come in and find true belonging. By nature, by our actions, we're all outsiders. But Jesus offers us another way. Rather than trying to prove ourselves or perform ourselves into the inside, which will never work, it's only pride and self-righteousness, Jesus offers that if we will simply give up our way and come close to him, we can be true insiders, we can belong to him. And then he gives us the delight of sitting at his feet and working with him in his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. What a beautiful truth this is. How hard it is. It's impossible, in fact, for us to do this on our own, isn't it? Lord, you've shown us so many ways that it's impossible for us to truly uh, turn from our sin on our own and that whenever we're willing and desiring to turn to you, to turn away from the self-directed kingdom, that it's because you're at work that in Jesus you've shown us a better way. You've shown us what it can look like to follow the king instead of being our own kings to give up control rather than trying to control everyone, including you. Father, we are not good at that. We regularly, even when we've heard this message and believed it before, we regularly take back control. We all of a sudden act as if we're God again. We ignore you. So we ask right now that you would give us grace for that. You would give us forgiveness and mercy. And you would teach us what it means to follow you. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus works. It's all his power. It's all his authority. And yet we have the privilege, the delight of responding by coming close, by belonging, and by having our wills conformed to the good and perfect will of the King. Father, thank you for offering us this today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. day of March has come Henceforth in fields of conquest That tent shall be our home Through days of preparation Thy grace has made us strong And now, O King Eternal We lift our battle song
Park, thank you for worshiping with us. Go with this benediction. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.